Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. My name is Skip Rutherford. I'm dean of the Clinton School, and thank you for uh, bearing with us while we moved over from the library, I mean, from the Clinton School to the library. We have, we're working on the sound here. How are we doing? Is it better? You know, Ruby, one of the things we did when we built this library is that we probably didn't do the best job on the acoustics. And I claim responsibility for that, so that's my fault. Um, so if you have any problem, blame it on me. Uh, thank you all for being here. Could I ask everyone to please turn your cell phones and other electronic devices off? I want to say a special thanks to Nikolai De Pippa, the director of our public programs, who just does a splendid job in bringing uh, quality speakers uh, for our students and for the community. And uh, we're honored, of course, tonight. Um, but we have a whole series of speakers, and we're, we're glad you could participate. And I also want to thank our wonderful volunteers, because when you do 100 programs a year plus, uh, it takes more than Nikolai and me. It takes a lot of people, and the volunteers do a great job, and Sita and others are here tonight. So I just want to say thank you to the wonderful volunteers. You all are special. A couple of months ago, Spirit Tricky called me, and she said, would you like to meet Ruby Bridges? And I said, does a bear go in the woods? She, I said, when and where? And she said, at the Central High National Historic Site in two hours. And I said, done. And because literally, um, all my life I have, um, as long as I can remember, um, wanted to meet that little girl in the white dress and uh, that powerful uh, painting. And to have a conversation with Ruby um, about her work, her life, um, and particularly her involvement in elementary education like Minnie Jean and others in secondary areas. Where's, is Minnie Jean here? She was coming as, she is. Minnie Jean Brown Tricky, stand up here, sweetheart. The, <laughs> one of the greatest public servants of our lifetime, and I will tell you, she recently just celebrated a birthday. Happy birthday. And she happens to be sp Spirit's mother, which of course is another great trait that, uh, but, but following that and, and watching what Minnie Jean and, and the Little Rock Nine had done at the secondary level, it was Ruby Bridges who became the example at the elementary level. And, um, and her story was so powerful. So when Spirit says, okay, she's gonna be here, I said, okay, I'm coming, I gotta go there and meet her, and, and I did. And of course, you see this picture. What you may not know is that this is the January 14th, 1964 Look magazine. This is where it premiered. Now, Saturday Evening Post rejected it because it dealt with civil rights. And Look didn't quite have the courage to put it on the cover. But in fairness, they did say the problem we all live with, painted for a look by Norman Rockwell, which was his first look painting. And here's the original. January 14, 1964. <laughs> Ruby's gonna sign this and we're gonna put it uh, in the Clinton School Library collection. To introduce our speaker, is Clinton School alumnus Spirit Tricky. She grew up in Ontario. She graduated from UALR, 
earned her master's degree at the Clinton School. She is an extraordinary human being in many talents, the playwright of one ninth. And if you haven't seen that play, we're gonna get her to do it again sometime because it is the story of her mom, the Little Rock Nine and Central High School in 1957 and it is absolutely powerful, very, very powerful. She's a park ranger at the Little Rock Central National Historic Site and she is one of the most remarkable young women of our time. Ladies and gentlemen, Clinton School alumnus, Spirit Tricky. Thank you, Dean, for that very, very warm introduction. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It is an honor to introduce our guest, Ruby Bridges, a hero, an icon, someone who helped shift the consciousness of the nation as a six-year-old first grader in 1960. According to Nelson Mandela, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which we treat our children. Mandela sentiments capture the essence of the impact that an in innocent, bright-eyed, charming child had on the nation and the world when she simply walked into William Franz Elementary School in New Orleans. Ruby Bridges was born in Mississippi. Interestingly, the year of the Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Board of Education, that outlawed segregation in public schools. Her family later moved to New Orleans, and in 1960, New Orleans began its desegregation process. On November 14, 1960, on her first day, Ruby was greeted by a vicious mob protesting her entrance. She was surrounded by federal marshals and became the first black student to attend William France Elementary School. She was the youngest foot soldier of the civil rights movement. Violence and graphic images depicting Ruby's school year splashed around the world, as Dean so eloquently alluded to, providing a clear revelation of our society's soul at the time. Ruby's plight can be seen in documentaries such as Eyes on the Prize and many, many other film chronologies, and even in the introductory film at the Clinton Library. The images of that event inspired the Rockwell painting, The Problem We All Live With, and this particular piece is an authentic print signed by Norman Rockwell that was donated to the Little Rock Central High School National Historic Site. Ruby Bridges has been featured on Oprah, Primetime, CBS News with Dan Rather, Good Morning America, and NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams. She has been the topic of stories in the New York Times, People Magazine, the LA Times, and various other print media. She has received honorary doctorates from Connecticut College, College of New Rochelle, and Columbia University's Teaching College. She is a member of the Board of Directors of the Norman Rockwell Museum. She founded and chairs the Ruby Bridges Foundation. She is the subject of a Disney movie, Ruby Bridges, as well as a book of the same title by Robert Coles. In 1999, she published her own memoir, Through My Eyes. A California elementary school is named in her honor. She is the recipient of the Presidential Citizens Medal bestowed by President Clinton, and even an honorary U.S. Federal Marshal. <laughs> and much like as she did as a brave six-year-old girl, she continues her quest through lectures, keynote addresses, and talks given in public and private schools across America. I recently learned that now little girls are dressing up as Ruby Bridges on Halloween. <laughs> the ultimate affirmation. <laughs> so 50 years ago, after her, 51 years after her heroic walk into William France, Ruby Bridges continues to reshape and work toward changing and healing America's soul by treating all children with dignity, respect, and demanding an equal education for all. So please join me to watch an archival clip of Ruby's first day of school.
It was just 1960, 39 years ago, that this six-year-old was asked to be the first black child to integrate in an all-white school. She was greeted by an intolerant and angry crowd of protesters spinning and yelling racial slurs. One group even displayed a small black dog in a coffin and made daily death threats to this innocent child who was merely starting in first grade. Her first year was spent alone with a single teacher. White parents refused to have their children in the same classroom as a black child. Because of her courage during the tumultuous times that were the civil rights movement, a hero was born. Her name, Ruby Bridges. After that introduction that Spirit gave, I'm sitting there thinking, who in the world is she talking about? <laughs> um, I'd like to first thank um, Dean Rutherford and Nikolai for extending this invitation uh, for me to come and share my story with you. I am deeply honored and very appreciative. Thank you so much. And thank all of you for uh, coming out tonight to uh, listen to what I have to say. Um, watching that film, um, I'm always asked, what, what do you think when you see that footage? What comes to mind? And I always say, how much I hated that doggone coat my mom made me wear. <laughs> and it's still haunting me to this very day. You know, um, I'm always, always asked about that year and my experience going into first grade. And I have to say that the truth is, is that I knew absolutely nothing about what I was about to venture into. It was 1960 and um, it was time for schools to be integrated in Louisiana, in New Orleans. And it is my understanding that the people that spearheaded that whole movement was the NAACP. And they were going into neighborhoods and doing door-to-door -door searches looking for people that would agree to send their children to an all-white school in New Orleans. My parents both were born in a small town called Tylertown, Mississippi. They were sharecroppers. And I've heard them talk all the time about not being able to go to school on a daily basis, that they had to get the crops in and so they were not able to go to school every day. And so the one thing that my mother wanted was for her children to have the opportunity for a better education. My father, on the other hand, fought in the Korean War. And I remember him saying that even on the front line, when it was his turn to go on to the front line, that you could be side by side with a white soldier fighting for the same country, and that if you lived that day and you went back that night or that evening, that you were not allowed to go back to the same barracks, that you couldn't eat in the same mess hall as a white soldier. And so my father felt like it really wouldn't change things to send me to this white school. Why do it? And so he was against it. But I always say, you know us women, we win in the end. And she did. She wanted her children to have the opportunity that she did not have. And so when the knock came at the door, she agreed and convinced my father to go along. I was already attending an all black school that was further away from my home. And I, I actually loved my school. Everyone in the school looked the same. I always point that out to kids when I'm speaking to them today. That all of my teachers were black, all of the kids, the people that work there at the school, everybody looked the same. And I loved my school. But now that was going to change. I remember my mom saying, Ruby, you're gonna go to a new school today and you better behave. <laughs> and actually that was the extent of what she told me. 
you know, and I always get people to um, come up to me and they say, well, you know, couldn't you have said, no, you didn't want to go? What did you say to your parents? And kids especially don't understand that during that time, <laughs> back then, you didn't say no, and you didn't ask why. And so I didn't. Um, I found myself getting dressed that day. And I remember it seemed like everybody was so excited. They were so excited about this first day of school that the neighbors came over to the house. Uh, they helped my mom dress me for school that day. And um, I remember the federal marshals driving up to the door and the knock on the door. When they knocked on the door, my parents opened the door and I remember standing there and seeing these four very tall white men. And I remember them having yellow bands on their arms. I thought to myself, well, who are they? I dared not ask, and I didn't. I remember them saying that we're federal marshals. We've been sent by the President of the United States, and we are here to escort you and your daughter to school today. And I remember us getting into the car. You know, living in New Orleans, we're accustomed to Mardi Gras. It's a huge celebration. Lots of people out in the middle of the street, and they're screaming and throwing things. And so there I found, that first day I found myself in the car, driving this very short drive to this new school. And the minute we turned the corner, I saw what I thought was Mardi Gras. I thought I'd stumbled onto a parade. There were so many people standing out in the middle of the street. And they were screaming and shouting and throwing things. Exactly what you just saw on screen. The car door opened and those federal marshals, they grabbed my hand. And I remember them saying, Ruby, walk straight ahead and don't look back. And they rushed us into the building. When I got inside of the building, I remember it being very quiet. We walked up to the top of the stairs and when we got to the office, we went in and we took a seat and we waited there. The next thing that happened is that crowd of people that you saw on the screen, they rushed in behind us. They rushed in and as I sat there in the office with my mom, they seemed to be really angry about something. Their faces seemed to be angry. They passed the window there and I could see them. And um, a few minutes later they would come back by the window and there were kids with them. And they kept passing the window back and forth, looking very angry and shouting. And I sat there and sat there and finally, as the day went on, the bell rang. Someone came into the office and they said, school is dismissed, you can leave. And I remember sitting there and looking at the clock on the wall, it was like three o'clock. And I thought to myself, wow, this school is easy. <laughs> I actually thought, this is very, very easy. Uh, nothing happened that day. The federal marshals took us, put us back into the car and drove us home. Little did I know what was really happening when those people knocked on the door to ask my parents if they would be willing to send their kids to integrated schools, my parents knew absolutely nothing about what they were about to venture into. Surely they knew that there would be some opposition. But I remember hearing my mom said that she would send me to school and that every day she would sit and pray all day to three o'clock until I walked back through the door. They had no idea what to expect. And it was very, very hard for them. My grandparents who were sharecroppers, who lived in Mississippi, farmed on their land for 25 years. They were asked to leave. People in Mississippi found out that it was their granddaughter that was causing all this trouble. My father lost his job. He was a service station attendant. And I remember that night him coming home because he worked right next door to a bakery. And the night that he was fired, I remember him coming home with bags and bags of 
donuts and breads and all sorts of things, and him saying to my mom that he lost his job. But his boss said that all of his customers were complaining. They knew it was his daughter. And so he wasn't able to work. It was extremely hard for them. My mother, she was the one that took me to school every day. And I say every day. She was only allowed to take me to school maybe the first week or so. Because during those days, parents weren't allowed to go into the classroom. And so she went that first week and had to go back home. And she said that was the hardest time for her sitting and praying and hoping that her child would come home. My father was asked not to escort me to school because they thought that it would be much easier for him to be upset and angered at the crowd. And so he wasn't allowed to walk me to school, which really, really upset him. I remember the second day the second day, it was the exact same thing. I remember getting dressed and the federal marshals coming to pick us up and getting into the car with them. When I got into the car with them, and they, I remember them driving very slow to this new school. My new school was very close to my house. We could actually walk. And as a matter of fact, most of the people in my neighborhood, they walked with us behind the car. And I remember the second day, as we drove up in front of the schools, the crowds were even larger than they were the first day. Because at that point, everyone knew which schools were going to be integrated. There were only two schools integrated in the city. And those two schools were kept secret. The only people that really knew which schools were going to be integrated was the people that were actually attending the schools. And so what you witnessed on the screen was parents that brought their kids to school and they didn't leave. They waited. They waited outside to see if indeed it was their school. And the minute I drove up, they knew. So the very next day, the crowds were even larger. I remember as they opened the door and we rushed inside of the building, when I got inside, you could hear a pin drop. It was so quiet. When I got to the top of the stairs on the second day, someone said, your class is down the hall. And those marshals, they turned me around and walked me down the hall to my classroom. And when I got to this classroom, the door opened and a woman stepped out. And I remember looking at her and thinking, she's white. She looked exactly like the people that were outside people that were screaming and shouting. But she said, come in and take a seat. And I remember standing there and looking around her into this classroom and all I saw was empty desk. And I thought to myself, my mom has brought me to school too early. <laughs> and indeed I was too early. But I went in and I took a seat and the teacher, her name was Barbara, Barbara Henry. She began to teach me. What I soon realized is that Mrs. Henry looks exactly like the mob outside, but she's not like them. She's different, and she was. She filled my day with things to do. She made school fun. I loved school, and it was because of her. She was different. She showed me her heart. And I knew that I could not judge her the same way as I could judge the mob outside. You know, teachers actually quit their jobs because they did not want to teach black children. Yet this woman came all the way from Boston to teach me. And she was like another mom to me. I absolutely loved school. The lesson that I took away that year is the lesson that I believe Dr. King tried to teach all of us. And that is that we should never look at a person and judge them by the color of their skin. That we owe it to ourselves to get to know one another. It is extremely important to me that I deliver this message across the country, especially to kids. 
because my experience comes from that of a child. And I don't believe that any child should have to go through what I went through, simply because of the color of their skin. It's a very valuable lesson that I learned, and it's ext extremely important today. I spend the majority of my time traveling across the country speaking to kids in schools because I believe that if we are to get past our racial differences, it's gonna come from our kids. I always say to kids that if you ever go into a nursery and you see all of these babies kind of lined up there together, that not one baby will turn and look at the other and say, I am not living next door to you. <laughs> I am not going to like you, love you, play with you. Babies don't do that. And it's not because they can't talk. It's because each and every one of us come into this world with a clean, fresh heart, a clean start. We know absolutely nothing about disliking each other. Racism is something that's passed on it's us, we as adults. We have kept it alive and we've passed it on. And here we are today, we're still dealing with the same thing, racism. And I think that that is such a disservice to our children. And I say that because I actually have kids of my own. And I remember my youngest child being six years old and I remember him coming home and saying to me, Mom, I want to go to a new summer camp. And I said, well, what's wrong with the one that you're going to? And he says, well, this one is different. They have all kinds of neat stuff for boys. And I really want to go. And yet I remember taking the flyer and looking at it and, and noticing that it was a school way across town in a different neighborhood, different people. I knew that there were people that didn't look like him. He didn't understand that. And so he kept saying, I really want to go, Mom. I really want to go. So I looked at him and I said, son, you're not going to know anybody there. I think your summer camp is, is a good one. Why don't you stay there? And I remember him looking at me straight in my eyes and saying, Mom, I'll get to know them. <laughs> and I thought to myself, okay, Ruby Bridges, <laughs> now you have to practice what you preach. And so I enrolled him. And I remember the first day going to pick him up. And he's coming to the car and he, he's uh, a little sad, his head is down. And I open the door and he gets into the back seat and I said, um, did you have a good day? And he said, no. And I said, you didn't? He said, no. And I said, why not? And he says, well, I didn't have anybody to play with. And I said, why? He says, well, I went over to the group. Every time I went to a group to ask them if I could play, they said no, that they had enough players. And I said, son, you know, this is only the first day. Tomorrow will be a new day. I'm pretty sure you, you'll make friends. And so I remember picking up the phone and calling the school and saying, listen, um, there's a couple of things that I want to mention to you about my son. First is that he's taking swimming lessons. And she said, you know, we have lots of water sports here. And I said, I understand. And she said, um, so do you feel like it's going to be a problem? And I said, well, you know, he's taking lessons. He doesn't know how to swim, but he thinks he knows how to swim. So I would like for you to just keep an eye out for him. And she said, definitely, we'll do that. And I said, and one other thing, he came home today, he was really upset, he didn't make any friends. And I was hoping that you would bring him over, introduce him to some of the other counselors, older ones, and um, maybe they could introduce him to some younger kids. And she said, definitely, we can do that. We want him to be happy here. So the next day I go back to pick him up. He's walking to the car and his hands are filled with all kinds of things. He has a hat and 
balls and all sorts of things and he's big smile on his face and he comes and he gets into the car and there's three or four older counselors with him and they speak to me and they shut the door he gets in and I said wow you look like you had a good day he said I did I said you did he said yes I made friends you were right and I said really so how did you do that? He says, I made five friends. And I said, I can't believe that. So how did you do it? He says, well, I jumped in the swim. I was drowning and five <laughs> friends. He said, five friends jumped in to save me. Oh, I will never forget that because I remember my husband looking at me like, oh God. <laughs> But you know, it reminded me of something. It reminded me of me being six. It didn't matter that he was drowning. What mattered to him is that he had five friends and he didn't care what they looked like. And I remembered that. I remembered day after day going into that classroom and looking for the kids, hoping that the kids would be there, and they weren't. I was never allowed to eat lunch in the cafeteria. People were always outside threatening to harm me in some way. They kept screaming, we're going to poison her, we're going to hang her. And the federal marshals, they met with my parents, and they said, you should prepare her lunch and she should eat it at her desk. They're threatening to poison her and so we don't want her in the cafeteria. And all I wanted was to eat lunch in the cafeteria. You see, because I remembered at the all black school that I'd gone to, all of the kids met in the cafeteria and we all had lunch together. And so every day I could smell the food cooking in the cafeteria, but I wasn't allowed to go. So in my mind, I kept thinking, they're not cooking for me. They must be cooking for the other kids. And so the kids are in the cafeteria. I have to get to the cafeteria. And so I decided that when my teacher would leave to go and get her lunch, that I would take my sandwiches and I would go to the back of the class and I would open up this cabinet and I would throw my sandwiches into the cabinet. And I would take my milk and pour it into this huge paste jar we used to use paste to do art with. And so I would pour my milk into the paste jar and she would come back and she would say, did you finish your lunch? And I would say, yes. But I didn't, because I wanted to go to the cafeteria. I wanted to make friends. Well, I have to tell you, the mice got really, really bad in that class. <laughs> mice started running all over the class, and she was afraid of mice. And so she called in the janitor. He came in, searched the whole class. I remember that day standing there. And when he went to the back and opened up that cabinet, all of my sandwiches came falling out. <laughs> I was in a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble because they actually thought that I was afraid of being poisoned. And so when they called my parents in for this conference, it was really a big deal. And I remember them coming to me and saying, why were you not eating? And why did you lie? And I said, because I want to eat lunch in the cafeteria with the other kids. And they finally took me to the cafeteria. You see, up until that day, I was never allowed to go onto the playground. I would stand at a window and look out of the window onto the playground, and all I saw was these same very tall white men with yellow bands on their arms. They were walking around the bushes, standing underneath the trees. And I remember sharpening my pencil and thinking to myself, I'm the only kid in the whole school. Nobody else is here. And so that day, I remember being so excited because they were taking me to the cafeteria. And I could smell that food cooking and 
We walked all over the school. Until that very day, I'd never seen my school building. They would bring me up one flight of stairs in the afternoon and down that same flight, I mean every morning and down that same flight every afternoon. So that day, it was like a field trip because I had an opportunity to see my school. The minute we got to the cafeteria and they pushed open the doors, nothing but empty tables. There were no kids. And I remember being so disappointed about that. I just knew they were in the cafeteria. My teacher, Mrs. Henry, she got a tray, she sat down and she ate with me. And those federal marshals, they stood right over us. When it got really cold, I would go into this coat closet to hang up my coat and every time I went into the closet, I would hear kids, voices. And I would mention it to my teacher and she wouldn't say anything. She just ignored me. And there were days when I would go back into the closet and I would just stand there, just to see if I really heard them. And I did. Finally, I realized what was going on. Because after telling Mrs. Henry over and over again, I hear kids. What I didn't know, I thought she was ignoring me. She wasn't. You see, there were white parents who tried to send their kids to school with me. Those white parents had to cross the same picket line that I did, and they were never protected by federal marshals. And so, as they crossed the picket line and took their kids to school, the principal would take the kids and she would hide them so they would never see me and I would never see them. But when I went into the closet, I heard them. And Mrs. Henry, she was constantly going to the principal and saying, you're breaking the law. The law's changed and kids are supposed to be together, yet you're hiding them. If you don't allow them to come together with Ruby, I'm gonna report you to the superintendent. And so that forced them to take me to where those kids were. And that is a day that I will never forget. Because I remember Mrs. Henry took me right back into that closet and there was a door there that I'd never seen. She unlocked it and we walked through that door. It led to another room and the minute we got into that room, she pushed open the door and there they were. Four or five kids were sitting there on the floor playing and I remember walking into that room and seeing them and thinking to myself, I knew I heard kids. <laughs> There they were, and I was so excited. It never crossed my mind that they looked different. I went in to sit down, to play with them. But that is the day, because a little boy looked at me and he said, I can't play with you. My mom said not to play with you because you're a nigger. And the minute he said that, I remember to this very day it felt as if this weight lifted off my shoulders. That all of a sudden by him saying that, I knew why there were no kids there. And I thought to myself, so that's what this is about. It's about me and the color of my skin. It's not Mardi Gras. That's why there's no kids here. It's all about me. And the truth is, even though he hurt my feelings, I was never angry with him. Because in my mind, I thought he was explaining to me why he couldn't play with me. He said, my mom said not to play with you. And I thought to myself, if my mom had said, Ruby, don't play with him. He's Asian, don't play with him. He's Indian, he's Hispanic, he's mis mixed race, he's white. If my mom had said not to play with him, I would not have played with him. So I wasn't angry with him, I understood. But today, today I don't understand. 
I don't understand why we are still taking racism and passing it on to our kids. I don't understand that. Our kids have so much more on their plates than we had when we were growing up. That we do our children such a disservice when we tell them that they need to only be friends with, only play with, only love people that look like them. We do not have that luxury today. We live in a very different world. Each and every one of us in this room, we understand that good and evil comes in all shades and colors. Evil doesn't care who it uses. It doesn't care what you look like. If we are about good, why should we care? If you are about good and what I am about, it doesn't matter to me what you look like. I want you on my team. It is so important that we get past our racial differences, that we understand that it is crucial, absolutely crucial, that kids understand racism has no place in the minds and hearts of our children. I say that because I have lost a son myself. He was actually murdered. And I know that the people that stood over him looked exactly like him. We do ourselves a disservice if we teach our children to only trust people that look like them. And then we open our door and we send them out into this world today. We have to come together for our children. We're losing too many of them. And so I always say to kids, racism is a grown up disease. We should stop using our kids to spread it. And that is the message that I want to deliver to you tonight. I, as I said, I decided to make this my life's work simply because it happened to me when I knew absolutely nothing about racism. I learned everything I needed to know that year in that classroom back in 1960. And it is so important today for me to pass that same lesson on to each and every one of our kids. Which brings me here today, this evening. I am so honored and proud to be here um, in a place that has decided to take on public service, to understand that you can actually teach it. Because we do need each other, and we do need to take care of one another. I think it's very, very important that we start as early as possible teaching that lesson. Community service, social justice, that it really doesn't matter what you look like. We're all in this together, and we have to take care of one another. Actually, that very day when I was in that car with federal marshals and the whole community walked behind that car, that was community service. That was taking care of their own, which is what we have to get back to. The truth of the matter is, is that I received thousands of letters all across the country. People from all walks of life, people that looked exactly like you who said that, leave her in school, you are doing the right thing. People that sent money because they knew that my father had lost his job. People that sent the clothes that I wore. I remember, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, I met someone who came up to me and said, you know, I actually sent you clothes to wear to school. And I thought, oh my god. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> but that's what we need to do again. 
and I believe that those same values can be taught to kids at a very early age. And so when I had an opportunity to meet Dean Rutherford, to talk about the Clinton School and the work that they're doing there, you see, I wanted to come here to speak to the students because part of my vision today is to actually apply for a charter to operate the very same school that I integrated. I believe that that school should actually teach history. We all know that in schools today, history is not being taught the way history happened, which is a shame. We are so busy covering up the truth that we're covering up the good. When I'm in schools, it's amazing that kids are not aware of the three young men that were murdered in Mississippi during voters' registration. And the fact that two of them were white and one was black, and that they were friends. Kids really are not aware of that story. The woman that came from Detroit went down to Mississippi to help drive people back and forth. She was white, left her family, shot and murdered. Kids don't know that story. They don't know that person's name. Not until recently did we know about the four little girls that were bombed in a church. There's so much very rich history that's been swept under the rug. It is time that we begin to teach history the way history happened. So that each and every one of our kids know that their ancestors made a contribution to this country. We absolutely have to teach history in a different way. And that's what I want my school to do. I also want that school to specialize in community service because we have to give back. We have to take care of one another and social justice. Kids need to understand at an early age that you must share your toys. And so I wanted to be here tonight to speak to the students that are here to challenge you to help me. I believe that you are doing such important work here today, but it's work that should start at a very early age. And so I am challenging you to help me to develop curriculum that we can use to teach what you guys are learning right here, to teach it to younger kids. It is very, very important work. I am extremely proud of the fact that you have the school here, and I wanted to come here to speak to you because I believe that it is a model that we can duplicate across the country. You know, it is such a shame that kids are not getting those same values and, and lessons at home, and so we, have to take responsibility, and we have to begin to teach it in school. It's not just about reading and writing and arithmetic anymore. We have to teach them values so that we can all begin to live together, to grow together, and to understand that we're all a part of one race, and that is the human race. Thank you so much. We're gonna take a few questions, uh, and please wait until the microphone gets there. Let me just say that before we do that, Clinton School students, you have just been challenged <laughs> to draft a curriculum of public service for what may be the most unique elementary charter school in the country, and I assume you will accept that challenge. I think uh, uh, your dean certainly uh, wants you to accept that challenge. All right, we have, we have some, uh, raise your hands, we have a question right back here. Yes, ma'am. Right yes, Ms. Bridges, did you remain in the same elementary school through the remaining years of, of your schooling? I did, I actually attended that school through sixth grade, and then um, went to, uh, junior high school, which was maybe two blocks away. Um, it was also an integrated school. 
we have a question right here, and I'll just give her this mic. As you progressed in uh, up to sixth grade, did it become more integrated as time went on? The plan was to integrate by grade level. So they started with first grade, um, two schools in the city, and once that year was over, and I went into second grade, then the schools were integrated in second grade across the city. Again, by the time I got into third grade, there were black kids in third grade with me, but also black kids in third grade across the city. So it progressed that way through sixth grade. I'm just so glad, uh, Ms. Bridges, to really see you. I'm from Louisiana, so I'm really glad to see you. Okay, my question. I'm 50 years old. I'm among the I was among the African Americans that were in the 70s generation that were bust. My question for you is, do you think integration helped improve the education of African American students since you integrated William France Elementary and those of us who were bused to white schools? If so, how? If not, why not? You know, I would have to speak from my own experience. Um, I believe that the majority of African Americans at that point in time um, really wanted their children to have the same opportunities. To have uh, an opportunity, um, as my mother always, always put it, uh, to have better books, um, um, better resources. And if I speak from my own point of view, I would have to say yes. But I've been criticized for that because what I've been told is that you were tutored. You had a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the teacher. Um, and that may very well be true. But um, I had kids of my own. And I've had uh, two of my kids that uh, wanted to go to all black schools, got a very good education. Um, but then the last two kids that I had went to integrated schools and um, they were exposed to um, different activities that maybe they wouldn't have had an opportunity to participate in. So um, I think even today that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to make sure that our schools are equal. Um, because again, it's not just reading, writing, and arithmetic. There's so many other, um, other resources and um, activities that I think our children need to be exposed to in every school. Thank you. We have a question right here. Hold on. You got a question right here? Do you have a, um, a sister or a brother? Do I have a sister or a brother? Believe it or not, I am the oldest of eight. Four boys and four girls. That's a lot of sharing. <laughs> Why did your mom and dad choose that school? Why did my mom and dad choose that particular school? That particular school was close to my house. Remember I said earlier that I was attending an all-black school first? I went to an all-black school for kindergarten, which was further away. I had to walk a long ways to get to that school. But this school was right around the corner. And even though it was an all-white school, once the law changed, that meant that kids could be together. And then I didn't have to walk as far. OK? How many years was it until your first day until the, um, the other children came to school? Um, the other kids, remember the kids that I said was in the classroom that I thought was hiding from me? They were there. I didn't see them until the end of that school year. And then by the time I got into second grade, the school was filled with kids. Did, she, did you always stay in contact with Ms. Henry, your teacher? No, as a matter of fact, Mrs. Henry and myself um, wasn't in touch for about 30 years. I met her in 1995 when the first book was published. Our names were never made public. And so once she left um, France school for second grade, by the time I got into second grade, she was gone. I really didn't know her name or how to get in touch with her. And it took actually 30 years before her and I were reunited on the Oprah Winfrey show. 
How did your son get murdered? My son, um, you know, that is a sort of long story. But um, he was actually driving, and someone drove up next to him and shot into his car. But it was a lot of different events that kind of led to that. Sad story. Hi, my name is Sydney Shear. I'm a first year Clinton School student. My Hi. question is, um, I feel like even though we've come so far um, with integrating schools, there's still a lot of school systems that seem like they're segregated. Um, you have private schools that are predominantly white and public school systems that are predominantly African American or minority. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on maybe how we can begin to kind of integrate those systems. I think that um, you're, you're absolutely, absolutely right. I spend almost every day in a different school across the country. And I have to honestly say, even though um, I've taken great pride in finding the best schools for my four sons, um, and some of them were public schools, um, one of them went to a Catholic school, there was so much that I was not aware of until I started to do this work. Um, I remember the very first time I went to a school in California to speak to kids. And it was on, it was a private school, um, sat on, I don't know, maybe 30 acres, a uh, huge Olympic side swimming pool. The cafeteria was like a restaurant. They had uh, a laptop on every desk. There were only maybe eight to 10 kids in the class. I remember that to this very day. And then there was another time that I went to a school in Detroit, Michigan to speak to kids. Inner city school, the windows were broken out. It was snowing and they were sitting in the classroom with coats on. And after seeing that, I thought to myself, now, if you really had to think about where our next leaders are going to come from. Your governors and mayors and presidents. Probably more likely the school in California with a laptop on every desk. But if a child sitting in that school in Detroit, he would have to have everything going for him. Everything. And even then, he would have to have someone to open a door for him. And I thought about that and I thought, you know, this is, this, this is truly not equal. But it had everything to do with money. And until we decide to take our money and put it into our schools, I believe it'll nev they're, they'll never be equal. How did your teacher feel meeting you? How did Mrs. Henry feel when we met on the Oprah show? After 30 years? She was so excited. I mean, it was unbelievable. And um, I was myself. There were things that I had questions. Um, I had questions that I really wanted answers to that only she could answer things that only she could confirm because it was only her and I in that classroom for the whole year. So it was really like meeting a parent that I had been separated from. So it was, it was amazing for both of us. We could go on forever, but we just simply can't. We've run out of time. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ruby Bridges. I want to show you another video something that just recently happened, and it really, really made me think about just how far we've come and how much further we have to go.
the painting depicts my walk into um, William Brandt School integrating the public school system in 1960. Can you still put your head back into the okay. chairs? And I knew every day. The girl in that painting at six years old knew absolutely nothing about racism. I was going to school that day. But the lesson that I took away that year in an empty school building was that none of us know anything about disliking one another when we come into the world. It is something that's passed on to us. So every time I see that, I think about the fact that I was an innocent child that knew absolutely nothing about what was happening that day, but that I learned a very valuable lesson, and that is, is that we should never look at a person and judge them by the color of their skin. That's the lesson that I learned in first grade.